distinguished speakers and guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you at the Sixth Lisbon Conference on Competition Law and Economics. This is a unique opportunity to discuss some of the most important topics that impact competition policy today with renewed experts that joined us from all over the world. Lisbon is an inspiring, beautiful and historical city which has been an international meeting point over the centuries. So today again, Lisbon serves as a hub for international dialogue and exchange. At the same time, we are celebrating our 20th anniversary. It's particularly rewarding to gather here in Lisbon at this time, friends, partners, and stakeholders to celebrate 20 years of the ADC. 20 years of dynamic activity and commitment that have led ADC to reach a high level of maturity, knowledge, and recognition. In fact, as many of you know, just recently the GCR ranked the ADC as one of the best eight agencies worldwide. And more importantly, we are celebrating 20 years of impact on society by promoting choice, opportunities, innovation, and growth. 20 years of work to the benefit of consumers, firms, and economy at large. So at this special moment, allow me to address a special word of gratitude to the President of the General Court of the European Union, who traveled to Lisbon specifically to this conference. The President of President Mark van der Voort here today represents an inspiration to all of us at the case law development by the General Court is a beacon who gave us in our daily work in competition law. Finally, I would like to extend a special thanks to Olivier Gersin, Director General for Competition at the European Commission. Soon after I took office as President of the ADC in March this year, I got hold of the prompt and continuous support that GD Comte and Olivier Gersin in particular have been providing to the ADC. A support that has been built on a relationship of trust as equal partners in all matters. The presence, at, uh, the presence at this conference of the Portuguese Minister of Economy and Maritime Affairs, Professor Antonio Costa Silva, was confirmed, but due to publicly known circumstances, he will not be joining us today. Nevertheless, I take this opportunity to express my gratitude for the institutional support that Minister Antonio Costa Silva provided to the ADC, knowing that independence of the ADC is not at odds with a good institutional cooperation, which is due to all. So, ladies and gentlemen, the current economic and social context is particularly challenging for any competition authority. The intersection between competition law and other areas of law and public policies is becoming more complex and calls for a clear view on the scope and level of intervention of competition agencies. It also demands a transparent and predictable action by the ADC that ensures legal certainty and security at all levels. Nowadays, competition agencies are prompt to act regarding a multitude of social issues, such as inflation, privacy, personal data, sustainability, digital markets, foreign subsidies, or labor markets, just to name a few. These issues remind us how wide the consumer's welfare standard is and how competition policy is flexible enough to integrate all dimensions that are valuable to consumers and ultimately to society at large. At the ADC, we have been closely following these developments with both enthusiasm and a strong sense of responsibility, aware of the impact of our actions in the pursuing of public interest and at the same time defending and promoting competition. Having said this, and as a part of the ADC's ongoing advocacy action, we undertook several initiatives in 2023. Just to name a few, in April this year, we published the paper called Defense of Competition in Times of Inflation, Recommendation on the Value of Chain Consumer of Goods. There, a set of recommendations aimed to raising awareness and compliance with competition law along with, with the, the value chain of consumer goods were issued. And also, the ADC has been active in promoting competition in self-regulated liberal professions by advocating the implementation of the OECD ADC recommendations 
and thus contributing to remove legal barriers to these professions. This has been carried out with an intensive and fruitful dialogue with the national government, the parliament, and public professional associations. Finally, this week, the ADC published an issues paper on competition and generative artificial intelligence. This is one of the first worldwide reflections on the interplay between competition and generative AI, where we map the main ingredients that will determine it in the future, the degree of competition in generative AI. So I do think this is an important paper as we need to get competition right in generative AI from the get-go to harness the full potential of a technolog technological disruption that it's finding its way to countless dimensions of our daily lives. So this will surely become a common topic of discussion in competition policy in the coming years. Nevertheless, competition policy cannot thrive without citizen engagement. And that is why this year we launched into the campaign 20 years, 20 cities, that aims to share with local communities, including small and medium enterprises, public authorities, universities, and local organizations, how they can benefit and contribute to improve competition at a local and regional level. But the work of a competition authority is not confined to advocacy and outreach. One of the key elements to an effective competition agency is to achieve a right mix of advocacy and enforcement, a mix where both dimensions are mutually reinforcing. So taking this into account, the ADC is keeping a strong focus on enforcing competition in order to stop illegal behavior. Just last week, we carried out an on-site inspection in the context of a new investigation related to collusion in the health sector. In this regard, allow me to address head on the difficulties we are having facing in the recent times. We do know that when it comes to the substance of the cases, courts have followed the ADC's decisions. I recall this year's Portuguese landmark judicial decisions that confirmed ADC's cases such as in a cartel case in the telecom sector, an RPM case in the food retail sector, and an abuse of dominant position case in the energy sector. Also, at the EU level, we we'll welcome the recent two ECG rulings which confirmed the ADC's approach in those cases. So the current challenge is to reestablish legal clarity regarding the investigative toolbox of the ADC. Here, one can say that competition authorities should have at their disposal an adequate toolbox to ensure effective enforcement. But that toolbox, and let me be clear, needs to include the power to seize and use digital evidence. This is clearly stated in the so-called ACN Plus Directive. And it has been rightly affirmed by the Portugal's Constitutional Court as compatible with the Constitution. So accordingly, and after carefully analyzing the recent court's rulings, the ADC is pursuing a multi-pronged strategy to assure the effectiveness of competition law enforcement, be it in the past, in the present, and in the future. So in this context, the ADC is contributing to clarify the facts of the past and present cases and the interplay between national and European legislation. At the EU level, we had the immediate support of the European Commission given by both Executive Vice President Margaret Vestager and by Digicom in order to continue our enforcement activity. Also, the power to seize digital evidence is under the assessment of the European Court of Justice in three preliminary ruling cases. And as this development unfolds, the ADC is in parallel fine-tuning its forensic IT tools and redesigning its teams so that we can keep fostering the effectiveness and our enforcement action. And for the future, I'm also sure that a discussion on the amendment of the Competition Act is likely to occur in the future in order to turn the legal text clearer, thus removing any potential interpretive doubts around the ADC's powers of inspection and use of evidence. And, but our enforcement activity is also visible when it comes to merger control. 2023 is a record year in terms of merging filings to the ADC, 72 so far. 
And if one considers the period between October 2022 and October 2023, the number is even higher, 85. So bearing those numbers in mind, I am pleased to say that we are able to keep our track record of green lighting the majority of these cases within a month. And furthermore, and on substance, on merger control, potential competition is taking the spotlight across many jurisdictions, like with the famous Illumina Grail case or the Microsoft Activision cases. And the ADC is no different on that regard. I must say that sometimes the competitive discipline by a target firm is more than meets the eyes. And at the same time, when it comes to international cooperation, we will continue to take part in the most important international networks and forum. Among others, I'm thinking of the ICN, where the ADC holds a position at the steering group, also at the European Competition Network, bringing together the European Commission and national competition authorities, at the OECD, where we witness its dedicated effort to share expertise and best practices, and here allow me a word of special thanks to Professor Frederic Geni and to Antonio Ferreira Gomes for being here today. And also to UNCTAD, where the ADC has been keeping a long-standing participation. And that has played an essential role, UNCTAD, in supporting the development of competition agencies in Portuguese-speaking countries, whose presence here I also welcome. And in this regard, allow me to pay a special tribute to Teresa Moreira, whose work at UNCTAD has reaffirmed Portugal's leading role in the context of international organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I have mentioned some of the challenges that the ADC has for the future, which I have no doubt will be overcome. In fact, I have been witnessing how extraordinary the ADC team is. Moreover, I am pleased to have two friends on the board of directors, Danis Fio Rodrigues and Miguel Morisilva. So, for these reasons, I look forward for the coming two days conference. I'm sure that with all the team that we have at ADC and for the knowledge that this conference will bring, the future of ADC will be brighter and ADC will remain at the forefront of the world's competition agencies for the next 20 years. So during these two days, we'll be discussing some of the most important trends in competition law, namely related to artificial intelligence, merger controls, cartels, the DMA, and exclusionary abuses. To guide us through these topics, we'll hear from our excellent lineup of speakers, to whom I'm grateful for their availability to participate. To conclude, I recall the famous phrase that was written by Justice Benjamin Cardozo in the equally famous book, The Nature of the Judicial Process. He said, and I quote, the ultimate cause of the law is the welfare of society. So inspired by that sentence and looking at this magnificent audience, I can say that the ultimate case of this conference is the welfare of society. So I do hope you enjoy your conference and thank you all for being here today. We will now hear a message from Olivier Gersin. He could not be here in person today, the Director General of DG Competition from the European Commission. And I hope you enjoy our conference today. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for your kind invitation to address this conference. And thank you to my friend Nuno in particular. It's really a shame I couldn't travel to Portugal especially as you are celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Portuguese Competition Authority. But I'm really glad that digital tools allow me to still be part of this event. Indeed, the digital transformation has improved our lives in so many ways. We communicate more easily, we shop more conveniently, and we enjoy new digital entertainment services. However, Large online platforms also pose new challenges, and in the last years, there has been a consensus on the need for action to address these challenges. This consensus is the reason why the process leading to the adoption of the Digital Markets Act, including the negotiations with the co-legislators, went so smoothly. In early September, we designated six gatekeepers for 22 core platform services. This 
is a key milestone that sets the date for the start of the enforcement phase, which is, as you know, 7th of March 2024. By that day, the designated gatekeepers will need to comply with the Digital Markets Act. Considering these developments, one could wonder about the future of antitrust enforcement in digital markets. But let's maybe be clear on this. The Digital Markets Act and antitrust enforcement, they do complement each other, and they will coexist as they address different issues. Indeed, we will continue to enforce Article 102 in relation to practices of gatekeepers that are not covered by the Digital Market Act. And in relation to dominant companies that either do not qualify as gatekeepers or do not provide core platform services. And of course, antitrust enforcement has inspired and will keep on inspiring digital regulation. I expect, therefore, that some of the antitrust concerns in the digital sectors will be addressed by the Digital Markets Act. This will allow us to dedicate more resources to pursuing cases in other sectors of the economy. Although the Digital Markets Act is one of the first digital regulations in the world, we are happy to see that other jurisdictions are taking steps in this direction. Given the globalized nature of the digital economy, different regulatory and enforcement regimes will inevitably interact with each other, and therefore effective cooperation is crucial. And of course, coordination will take place across the board. It will not be limited to digital regulation. As the Digital Markets Act and antitrust enforcement will coexist, we also will need to coordinate increasingly closely with antitrust enforcers within the EU. Indeed, while the Commission is the sole enforcer of the Digital Markets Act, National competition authorities can conduct market investigations. They can apply their national rules to the extent their scope does not overlap with the Digital Market Act in terms of regulated companies and obligations. And this is the reason why coordination within the European Competition Network will be pivotal to avoid divergent outcomes and the duplication of efforts. In this regard, I would like to mention that two colleagues from uh, the Dutch National Competition Authority have joined us for a period of six months as part of a joint Digital Markets Act investigative team. And I really want to thank my friend Martin Snoop for, for this. And DG Competition will be extremely happy to extend this initiative to other national competition authorities within the ECN. In view of our long-standing tradition for effective cooperation within the European Competition Network, I am confident that we will work together very well also in implementing the Digital Market Act. This is especially important as the challenges of digital markets are not getting any easier. Artificial intelligence, or AI, will probably transform much of our work, but also much of our lives. AI is likely to bring many benefits, create new opportunities, but AI may also raise challenges related to biases, fairness, privacy, security, accountability, and transparency, just to name but a few. And this is why already, back in 2021, the Commission proposed a new package to boost investment in AI, but also to regulate it. The proposal to regulate AI, which we call the AI Act, is currently under negotiations. Its aim is to ensure that people can trust that AI is safe and compliant with fundamental rights. Now, AI may also raise competition concerns. 
First, AI may facilitate collusion between algorithms or make it more difficult for competition authorities to detect them. This is why DG Competition is increasing its capacity to detect antitrust enforcement, infringement. Sorry. Second, the AI sector itself may raise competition concerns. Based on our experience in digital markets, anti-competitive strategies and a winner-takes-it-all outcome cannot be excluded. And this is because AI systems rely on vast amounts of computing power and data. Companies that have access to cloud services facilities and vast amounts of data or to unique data sets may be incentivized to favor their own AI systems. In turn, these AI systems, once deployed on smartphones or on virtual assistants, may be used to favor the other services that these companies provide. A lack of competition in the AI sector may exacerbate the societal challenges that AI already raises. The Commission has an important role to play in ensuring that AI remains innovation-intensive and that consumers and businesses have a broad choice of AI systems. These are all the reasons why we are monitoring closely the development of the AI sector. We stand ready to address competition concerns through antitrust, if these competition concerns materialize, merger control, for example, if company engage in killer acquisitions, and of course, the Digital Markets Act, where we have the possibility to add new core platform services like AI systems, if and when warranted. As you can see, work on digital markets makes up a lot of working hours. At the same time, our policy works cover many different work streams. And I would like to conclude this address by talking about the initiative aiming at adopting guidelines on exclusionary abuses of dominance. In response to a call for evidence that was published on the 27th of March, we have received 48 submissions. The respondents generally welcome the initiative and they see it as an opportunity to systemize the case law and bring more clarity to the enforcement of Article 102, while at the same time maintaining, of course, the effects-based approach, which indeed is exactly our aim. We want to enhance legal certainty and we want to give clear guidance to businesses while at the same time clarifying that the ultimate purpose of Article 102 is the protection of consumer welfare. We very much hope that this will benefit all stakeholders, including national competition authorities as well as national courts. The main purpose of the guidelines is to clarify how the effects-based approach, by now well-established, will apply. So, when thinking of the post-guidelines world, I would expect to see a fair degree of continuity in our current approach to Article 102 enforcement. We will continue to run cases based on effects, and we will rely on the insights and assistance of economic analysis, if and where appropriate. Economics definitely play a role in our competition law assessment and can assist in the identification of sound theories of harm. This said, economic analysis is only a part of an overall assessment of all the relevant facts and circumstances. It also needs to remain within the boundaries of a workable standard, 
and not be treated as a scientific proof of the existence or the absence of anti-competitive effects. We plan to publish a draft of the guidelines by mid-2024, and in the meantime, we will continue our consultations with the stakeholders. In particular, our exchanges within the European Competition Network have already provided valuable input. With the wide experience collected on the enforcement of Article 102 and the equivalent national provisions by the emphasis in all member states, we believe that this dialogue will enrich the text of the guidelines. This concludes my address, and I would just like to wish you all a very interesting conference, where you will also hear from a number of other senior officials from DG Competition later today and tomorrow. I would like to thank again the Portuguese Competition Authority, congratulate you all, thank my friend Nuno, and once again, many happy returns for the Autoridade da Concurrencia. Goodbye.